So this is a, a great uh, <coughs> pleasure to be here. As uh, an author, uh, you often don't know who is reading you. So it's great uh, to come here in Turkey and find out that people actually read what I write. And uh, it's a great pleasure to see so many of you here. Uh, as some of you may know, one of my projects right now is to uh, put uh, the lectures on Marx's capital on the web, and we're now putting the lectures on volume two. Um, and uh, volume two of Capital is uh, one of my favorite books, even though it's probably the most boring book that Marx ever wrote. Um, and it's my favorite book in many ways because it's there that he starts to define how capital creates its own space and time. Uh, it's also uh, the book where he talks about transportation and fixed capital and turnover times. Uh, but as I go through it, I realize that it has several clues which are very, I think, important for the most recent work I've been trying to do, which is really the work on how to connect uh, the history and dynamics of urbanization with what's going on in the overall dynamics of accumulation of capital and what's going on in the macro in the macro economy. And there's one piece of the story in volume two which I think is very intriguing. And I've been thinking about it, so I want to share it with you. Uh, at one point, Marx uh, builds a very, very simple model. Um, he, he does this sort of thing. He, he creates a very simplified version of the world in order to understand something which is of critical importance. And the simplified model he makes goes something like this. He said, imagine you live in a world where there are only two classes, workers and capitalists. What's the relationship between demand and supply in that world when there is accumulation occurring? And he points out immediately that there is an imbalance in demand and supply. The demand is set by capital as it invests in means of production, machinery, and all the rest of it, and as it purchases labor power. So that's the total demand which is released into the economy at the beginning of a day, say. But at the end of the day, if the capital, if capitalist is doing his or her job right, they end up with surplus value. So the supply at the end of the day is going to be equivalent to the amount spent on reproducing the initial, original means of production, the amount that the laborers are consuming in, from the wages, and the surplus value. In his notation, the supply equals C plus V plus S, the demand is C plus V. So he then asks the question, where does the demand, extra demand come from to absorb the surplus value that is produced at the end of the day? Can it come from the laborer? Clearly, that is impossible. Furthermore, the more you repress wages, and the more you exploit labor power, the bigger the gap becomes between the amount of demand you've released and the supply you've released, you've created. So Marx says there's only one class that can actually solve that problem, and that's capital, which creates a very peculiar economy. But capital has to 
supply, the effective demand to absorb the surplus value which is extracted from the workers. And then Marx kind of says, well, in the long run, of course, to the degree that the wealth of the capitalist is extracted from the workers, then eventually the workers are supplying the capitalist with the wherewithal to cover the gap. So it's capitalist consumption which actually gives the extra demand needed to absorb the surplus value. But capitalists consume in two ways. They consume as individuals, necessities and luxuries. But they also engage in something called productive consumption. And productive consumption is the reinvestment of part of their surplus in new means of production, new labor power. So, to cut a long story short, the way in which you balance supply and demand in that economy, as Marx lays it out, is that the capitalists use the extra demand which they create the day after to mop up the surplus value they produced the day before. In other words, it's the continuous expansion of the system which permits the difference between demand and supply to be covered. And that in itself is a kind of interesting story, except when you look at it, you find out there's a time gap here between when the demand comes into being and when the supply comes online. And the only way you can cover that time gap is to engage in the famous capitalist practice of buying now and paying later. In other words, you operate on credit. Now this is a crucial finding because it turns out when you take that argument a little bit further, you find that the accumulation of wealth on the part of the capitalist class depends entirely on the accumulation of debt. And actually, it's very interesting to look at global debt figures throughout the history of capitalism and match them with global growth figures. Now, there's a lot of chatter in my part of the world these days about how terrible it is to have all of this debt. And we've got to stop creating all of this debt. And the Republican Party is particularly fierce about trying to get rid of all of this debt. But if Marx's argument is correct, if you get rid of all of the debt, you actually end capitalism. So I wrote a nice little piece for the Wall Street Journal suggesting that in the event this happened, the Republican Party might do a better job of ending capitalism than the workers' movement has ever done. Of course, the Wall Street Journal didn't publish it, but you can find it on my website. Now, I get into this because this has a lot to do with the temporality of capital accumulation. And one of the arguments I've been making for a long time is part of this productive consumption which is going on involves investment in the built environment. And so I've argued that for a long time the demand supply problem, the tendency to over accumulate capital problem is resolved by surges of surplus capital into the urbanization process. And those surges actually very often correspond to times and moments when capitalism in general is in a lot of trouble. If you look at the data from, say, 1990s to the present day, 
you would see surplus capital flowing very strongly into various activities. In the 1990s, we had the high-tech bubble, the new economy. You had these strange companies that you thought were actually producing electricity, but were in fact just producing debt. And some of them went bankrupt in 1998. And there was a stock market crash, 2000, 2001. And the surplus capital seemed to have nowhere else to go, except into the property market. So what you start to see in the United States and also in various other parts of the world is a rapid switch of capital flows into the property market. Commercial property, housing, infrastructure, and all the rest of it. That flow was facilitated by another peculiar feature of the supply and demand for those kinds of products. A financial institution will lend to a developer, and the developer will build tract housing outside of San Diego. Then the developer will need to sell the housing to somebody. So what happens is the same financial institution that has lent the money to the developer lends money to the buyers. So that indeed, demand and supply can be balanced, except the developers take their money at the outset and go home with it, and then it is the buyers who have to pay off the housing through a housing mortgage owed to the financial institution. What that then also presumes is that the people who have been lent the money, have enough to pay off the mortgage. And what we saw in the 1990s was that that was no longer actually always the case. So under President Clinton, there began a program to make mortgage finance available to low-income populations, and particularly minority populations. African-Americans, Hispanic immigrants, and the like. That program came a little bit to a stop in 2000, 2001. But under the Bush presidency, it boomed again. And increasingly, of course, we know the phenomena. More and more money was being lent to people with almost zero credit rating very low income streams in order to keep the whole boom going. And of course it kept bo booming because property prices were going up. And as property prices went up, so more people wanted to get into the housing market. And so we get this boom in housing which suddenly comes to an end in 2007, 2008. This process was not only happening in the United States. It was also happening in Spain, it was happening in Ireland, and various other parts of the world. Even in the United States, it was not happening everywhere. The crisis had its epicenter in the southwest of the United States. Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, and the other side of the continent, Florida and Georgia. If you took away those markets, there would have been no massive crisis of the sort that we saw. So this is, if you like, where the crisis which struck in 2008 came from. But notice, this crisis was the result of resolving another crisis which had existed before, in 2000 and 2001. 
And if you go back even further, you suddenly see a whole pattern where housing and commercial property and physical infrastructures are the vehicle whereby capital gets out of crises and gets back into them again. There's a wonderful statement that came out from the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank which said, you know, when we look back we see that in the United States we have one very important way in which we resolve crises. We build houses and we fill them with things. That is the effective demand which is mopping up the surplus at the end of the day comes out of that process building houses, filling them with things. And if you go back historically you'll see again and again a complicated relationship between what is going on in urbanization and the troubles which exist in the economy in general. But the astonishing thing is that nobody really has looked at it very closely. Only recently have people gone back and looked at what happened in the United States in the 1920s. In the 1920s there was a similar boom in the property market. A huge increase in property prices, speculative activity in commercial property and particularly in New York and Chicago and also in Florida. That boom came to an end precisely one year before the total stock market crash of 2000 uh, of of 1929. And that of course led into the Great Depression. So what we see is that actually a housing component and a property market component of what triggered the Great Depression. If you look around the world you see there was a tremendous boom in, in the Japanese economy. If we were talking about the world global economy in this room in the 1980s, we would have said Japan is the place to look. It's the hegemonic economy, it's really driving very fast. And suddenly it all collapsed in 1991. And why did it collapse? Land prices. Around that same time, Sweden had to nationalize its banks because of speculative activity in housing markets. In 1973 there was a global crash in property markets that triggered a lot of the difficulties that occurred in the Western economies during the 1970s and led actually into a crisis of municipal finance that led New York City which then was about the tenth largest public budget in the world to go technically bankrupt in 1975. So what I'm stressing here is this strong association between capital accumulation. And the big one is this, that before World War II in the United States, the rate of new housing construction stood at the level of around half a million units a year where the considerable fluctuations up and down. After World War II it averaged 1.5 million a year. What saved the US economy from going back into depression in 1945 armed as it was with a much expanded productive capacity given the war effort, armed as it was also with a vast increase in the labor force because women had been brought into the labor force. What got the United States out of the prospect of another Great Depression in the 1940s, 1950s was suburbanization. <coughs> 
And boy, was suburbanization about building houses and filling them with things. You've seen all those movies, you know, of life in suburb, suburban life in the 1950s and 1960s. The refrigerators, the swimming pools, the tremendous demand that was associated with the suburban lifestyle. But that demand was also backed up by something else, which was rising incomes for the working classes, for a, a serious segment of the working class at least, mainly the white unionized working class, which meant that they could actually afford the suburban lifestyle. But that was also matched by all of those reforms which were put in place in the 1930s to try to stimulate the housing market. And these reforms involved the creation of new financial institutions. So money could flow easily into the housing system and into property development. And those reforms also ensured housing against default. At the same time, as this was going on, there was a campaign to talk about the American dream. So all the soldiers coming back from World War II were saying, you've come back and you fought for freedom and the freedom for you is embodied in the American dream, which is having your own house, home ownership in the suburbs. And as they talked about that American dream, they casually said on the side, of course, this is going to help pacify a potentially restive population, make them all favor capitalism. It was a famous phrase which was used in the 1930s, debt encumbered homeowners don't go on strike. They don't create trouble. So this whole program from 1945 onwards, right up until 2008, 2009, involved this vast suburbanization process and a reurbanization of the inner city as well through gentrification and disnification, creation of urban spectacle and all the rest of it. In other words, the, uh, the transformation in urban lifestyle played a very important political role because the suburbanites all vote for the Republicans. The suburbanites start to forget about the city as a whole and think about the security of their own little gated community. So it fragments the politics of the city. It creates a socially pacified world at the same time as it deals with that foundational problem that Marx had mentioned about how to match demand and supply on a continuous basis over time. Well, it all fell apart in 2008. For the first time, when you get to 2009, the rate of home ownership, the home construction, has fallen back into the same level of the 1930s. In other words, the suburban solution is over. The United States has to do something else. What can it do? Very hard to see what it can do. Now I've used the example of the United States here because that story is very clear to me. But when I studied Second Empire Paris between 1850 and 1871, you saw a similar story a property market boom in central Paris, the building of the boulevards, the building of the new department stores, the creation of a new urban lifestyle, which stabilized the economy until the debt became too big. And there was a crash in 1867. Then a crisis of municipal finance the year after. And then Louis Bonaparte, not knowing what to do, decided what some rulers often do, which is to go to war 
and he lost and we ended up with the Paris Commune. So the dynamics of this process, which are not often talked about, are absolutely central to the story of how capital accumulation works. And the thing that has been very surprising to me is that when I go to the literature and I did a housing search, housing market search, in the conventional economics literature about the connections that might exist, there was almost nothing in the conventional literature at all. And, of course, when I went back to the Marxist literature, the only literature I could find was the things that I had written and a few other people had written. In other words, people don't seem to recognize how significant this is. And if you look right now at that part of the world which is flourishing and that part of the world which came out of the crisis of 2007, 2008 very fast, what do you see? At the end, by the end of 2008, early 2009, China had lost 30 million jobs in about six months because of the collapse of the export industries which collapsed because of the collapse of the US consumer market. 30 million jobs. An ILO report came out at the end of 2009 looking at the net job losses around the world. When it looked at China, it said their net job loss is 3 million. In other words, China had created 27 million jobs in less than nine months. What were people employed on doing? During this period, China has built two new, whole new cities that have no residents in them yet, and they're still waiting for people to come. There was a great advertisement in the New York Times the other day, big like this, said, come to this city. We have all the facilities you want. We'll subsidize you to come. The Chinese had a huge infrastructure project, new rail lines, new highways. The Chinese also told their banks to lend to local development projects. Now in the United States, if President Obama tells Goldman Sachs what to do, Goldman Sachs will tell him just go away. If you're a Chinese banker, you don't do that. You do what the Central Committee says you've got to do. And the Chinese banks lent mainly to property development. So there was a huge property development boom. Property prices in Shanghai doubled in one year. A huge construction activity went on. In other words, the urbanization project of China over the last few years has absorbed vast amounts of surplus capital and labor and has done, in effect, the same sort of job that suburbanization did for the United States after 1945. And of course, anybody who supplies means of production to China, raw materials in particular, has flourished very well. Much of Latin America, which has reoriented its trade to China, is doing very well. It's growing at 8%. China's been growing at 10%. It's Europe that's at close to zero. United States, lucky if it makes two. So urbanization is, in fact, the answer for China and the answer for much of the rest of the world. And actually, if you look at the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, you'll see similar booms going on. And what did I see in Istanbul? Cranes all over the place. 
And I made the remark, I said, it looks like Spain looked like five years ago. My point here is, watch out when you have one of these booms, because you can get overextended very easily and there can then be a collapse. There are serious problems in China of overcapacity. They've built too many airports, they've built too much infrastructure, their property market is overheated, and they've got all sorts of issues. It turns out there are a lot of underperforming loans in the Chinese banking system, which, by the way, there have been before. And it may take a massive effort by the central government to spend all of its foreign exchange reserves on recapitalizing its banking system. So this is, I think, a crucial part of the story. Now, if this is a crucial part of the story, then the other part of it is, if cities are being built, not the way people want them to be built, but the way capital has to build them in order to rescue itself from these periodic disasters, then in what ways can we say that the capitalist city is actually meeting people's needs and actually meeting people's wants, needs and desires. And to what degree are people being pushed around in cities in order to make way for this developmental process? And of course Engels, way back in 1872, wrote about displacement of vulnerable and low-income populations from potentially high-rent land. And he wrote that in 1872, and it shocks me that people are still, still surprised it's still happening. But you say this is the central form that capitalist urbanization takes. Which then brings me to the question, to what degree are all of these struggles that we see by social movements in the cities part and parcel of what we might call an anti-capitalist agenda? And to what degree, if we think in anti-capitalist terms, do we have to say that the city has to be one of the big questions that has to be inserted into the discussion? When you look back, you find all kinds of urban struggles that have gone on, some of which have led into revolutions. 1848, a, a revolution in Paris. But the interesting thing here, it wasn't only in Paris, it was also in Milan and Frankfurt and Vienna. In other words, there was a revolutionary movement that spread through the urban network. 1968 wasn't only Paris, it was Chicago, it was Bangkok, it was London. One of the phenomenal events in recent history was a day, February the 15th of 2003, when there were three million people on the streets of Rome, two million on the streets of Madrid, two million in Barcelona, a million and a half, maybe two million in London. Protests in something like 280 cities around the world against the prospect of going to war with Iraq. It was the urban network. The Occupy movement very recently had lots of little kind of boom through the urban network. In the 1960s, there was a generalized urban crisis in the United States where about 40, 50 cities in the United States saw urban uprisings in the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King. In other words, the city is not only a site where class struggle, 
and revolutionary activity occurs, it's also one of the stakes in revolutionary action. Because one of the stakes which was very important in 1968, for example, were the qualities of urban life. And interestingly, in the United States, a lot of what happened in 1968 was a revolt against the suburbs. The feminist movement called the suburbs the place with no name, in which women were trapped into a certain lifestyle which was horrendous. Suburban youth were bored. They'd seen a few European cities and said, let's have a different quality of urban life. Let's have sidewalk cafes and things like that. So the struggle is often over the qualities of urban life. But I have a lot of Marxist friends who tell me they're not really class struggles. They're just urban social movements. Class struggles really occur in the factory. The proletariat exists in the factory. And they're all depressed in the United States because the factories have disappeared. So you have to say to them, well, if you want to find the proletariat, go to China. <laughs> but, actually, you have a proletariat that is making and remaking daily life in the city. And they're actually producing value. Go read volume two of Capital. Transport workers produce value. All of those truck drivers delivering things around these cities are producing value and creating surplus value. Let's organize the truck drivers. And if you can organize the truck drivers, it's a very effective way of getting people's attention. When there have been major transport strikes, it's a very, very good way to draw people's attention. Taxi drivers. Well, we have an organization of taxi drivers in New York now. Very interesting to see what happened when that organization starts to, to become militant. So, the city then becomes, as it were, the site and the stake in a lot of struggles which are class struggles. So I would I say to my Marxist friends, why don't we redefine the proletariat as all those people who are contributing to the production and reproduction of urban life? And then why don't we think about how to organize that proletariat into an anti-capitalist struggle, to build an alternative city, a, a city that is not defined by the requirements of capital accumulation forever, but a city that is defined by the use values and the facilities which are going to contribute democratically to a decent life for everyone. And if you look backwards, I say to them, you'll see that there were events like the Paris Commune where the city was the center. You'll see uprisings in cities like Cordoba in 1969. Most recently, you'll see an uprising in the city of El Alto in Bolivia. In fact, two uprisings, both of which got rid of presidents of Bolivia and which paved the way for Evo Morales to come to power. The same city is now at odds with Evo Morales because he's compromising with the neoliberal order. He's compromising with imperialist pressures. And the people in El Alto are saying, you can't do that. We put you in power to contest all of that. So the revolutionary stakes in his urban struggles are very, very strong. And I therefore think that we should pay much more attention to a simple question that was asked me by 
a trade unionist friend of mine who looked at this and said, how do you organize a whole city? And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, you know, you're supposed to think about these things. Why don't you go away and think about it and, and, and give us some ideas about how to organize a whole city? And so I did say to him, well, you know, why don't you tell me what you union guys can do? And he said, well, look, there are two strands within the union movement. One organizes on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. So you have the public sector workers, and you have the auto workers, and you have, you know. The other works on a geographical basis and talks about all the workers in New York City, all the workers in Los Angeles. And I suddenly remembered that actually in Britain there are these trades councils which are focused on cities. And the trades councils tended to be much more radical than the sectoral unions. And they were more radical for a very simple reason. That their conception of the proletariat was everybody living in the city who was producing and reproducing urban life. And they wanted to change what the city was about. Whereas the sectoral units just looked after their own membership. We get a better deal for our members and that's it. Okay, we have alliances with other unions, but nevertheless, our fundamental mission is simply our members in this particular class of worker. So, we talked about this and said, well, we should really emphasize to the union movement that they should pay far more attention to territorial organization and territorial organization that is not simply about work-based questions, but is also about living space questions. Because it then turns out that in the history of labor struggles, those struggles which survive best and, are most, uh, and can be most victorious always, always involve an alliance between the workers in the factories and the people in the neighborhoods around the factories. We see this in Argentina right now. Factories were taken over in 2001, 2002 by many workers. But the workers threw the factories open and turned them into cultural centers and educational centers for the whole neighborhood. And so there's great solidarity between the workers in the factory and everybody who lives around. And now that the Argentinian economy has recovered, the original owners come back and say, we want our factory back, or we want to take all of our machinery out of the factory. And as soon as they come down, the whole neighborhood assembles and says, uh-uh, you're not going to do it. So they're stopped from doing it. And when you go back and you look at the history of labor struggles and look at the role of neighborhood support, you find it is that unity between the workplace and the living place which becomes crucial in the study, in, 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 in the struggle. Now this is one of the things, again, that I try to educate people to. So they then start to think, okay, it is possible to organize a whole city. It is possible to start to put clear demands on the transformation of urban life transformation of urban life which is much more egalitarian, transformation of urban life which is going to deal with social inequality, transformation of urban life that is going to deal with the failures of delivery of public services. Those are all possible agendas which can be blended together within an anti-capitalist struggle. Now the, then the big question is why should we think in terms of an anti-capitalist struggle? Why don't we just think of a series of reforms within capitalism? And my answer to that is, I think, quite simple. Capitalism is about growth. It's about compounding growth. 3% compound growth forever. 
is what capital demands. 3% compound growth from now on in is becoming increasingly difficult to maintain. And you can see by the speed with which many parts of the world are being transformed. The speed of urbanization in China, the speed of growth of Istanbul, the speed of growth. Can you imagine that speed of growth continuing for another hundred years? God, what would the place look like? You have to start thinking about a zero growth economy down the line and a stable economy and an urbanization process that actually fits that stability. And again, that would say to me that the city is the locus of a crucial set of struggles and those struggles are about the city and for the city, not simply located in the city. Okay, let me leave it there. Thanks very much.